tell you to work with a group of folks that it doesn't matter who you are, who you are, what you do in life. <laughs> I'm Sarah Randolph, Foundation Communications Director for Femi and Monoba, and I am Monoba.
Good evening, everyone. How are you all doing tonight? Welcome to the Royal Room. Glad to be, good to be back here in the place that we call our second home. Uh, the, the staff here treats us so nice, so hopefully we can um, reward them at the end of the evening. But it's great to kind of see everybody's familiar face and be a part of this program that, for me, has been a great opportunity to talk about climate change. So um, a little bit about uh, myself, I'm Joey Manson, I'm the Center Director of Super Park Audubon Center, and of course, we do things in many ways as possible to try to connect people to nature, hoping that they te uh, use those, that love of the nature to take conservation actions. Um, a couple of years ago, we came out with a study that talked about what's going to happen to the birds that we know and the birds that we don't know in the face of climate change. Uh, if you notice the name of our program series here, it's called uh, Three Degree Affair. And we're talking about currently what's happening in terms of the, 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 the climate change and the increase in the world's temperature. And we've already noticed what's happening with one degree change. We, are, we basically put together a list of birds and looked at what would be the outcomes at two degrees and three degree changes. A lot of that is encapsulated in the handout that you received when you came to the door, but Audubon has a great website, so you can look at birds that you know, birds that you don't know, or birds you've heard about, and you can punch them in, and you can see what's going to happen to them in the face of one, two, and three degree changes. So it's called Survival by Degrees. If you just look for that in Audubon, you'll find it. And you can see here for a bobolink, you can see what it looks like under a one and a half degree uh, temperature change scenario, under a two degree temperature scenario, and under a three degree temperature scenario. So we're looking at some really serious stuff that's going to happen if we don't do some serious changes about the methane and, and carbon that we put in the air, which makes our, our tonight's presenter that much more important. Um, we're talking about Eric Scigliano. And he uh, used to be a neighbor of ours, but he's very familiar with the Royal Room, and some of you may know him out there. But uh, he's a person who's always been interested in that area that connects climate and the Arctic. And of course, this is the pinnacle of that work, looking at uh, the permafrost. Uh, Eric, probably need my glasses for this part. <laughs> So Eric is a, a, a regular writer, regular contributor for Crosscut Magazine, which I imagine many of you have heard of. Also Political Magazine, too. So he's a, a regular person who contributes to their knowledge of science and climate and somebody they call on. He also is a writer at Natural History Magazine. He's been a winner of the Livingston and AAA's uh, prizes for reporting. He ri he's written for Harper's, New Science, New York Times, and um, he's been a, a science writer for the University of Washington. He's done his own individual books like uh, Michelangelo's Mountain, The Quest for the Perfect um, Marble Quarries, Flotsometrics and the Floating World, which is flotsam and jetsam are two of my favorite words, and so that's definitely something I to look into. And this wonderful title, Love, War, and Circuses, The Old Age Relationship Between Elephants and Humans, which I'm not sure any of you really knew about. The book that we're talking about tonight is The Big Thaw, and so it's, um, it's been a winner of the Washington State Book Award, also a winner of the Nautilus Award, an award for small book publishers and independent booksellers. So this is a phenomenal work that we're talking about, and I believe that he has a lot of passion behind this work because the, the, the world needs this type of reporting and the world needs this type of understanding. And this world needs this also kind of motivation, which would be kind of like the last part of this. So please put your hands together and welcome Eric Scigliano to the stage. Thank you to Seward Park Audubon for, uh, for uh, bringing attention to things that everybody needs to think about and not everybody wants to hear about. Uh, but first I've got to say, you know, my, my sax has been gathering dust for a couple of decades and yet I still get to play the Royal Room. I'm, <laughs> well, sort, sort of, sort of. Um, thank you, Royal Room. Uh, the challenge in writing about climate change uh, is to find something more to say than another iteration of the same, uh, the same tale of gloom and doom and folly and greed. 
Uh, this book is an attempt to do that, as Joey suggested, um, without shortchanging or sugarcoating the, the tough truth. Part of that mission lies in, uh, part of that mission lies in sharing and celebrating the, um, the richness and uh, sheer beauty of the wild worlds within the world uh, that will be uh, lost or terribly altered as change progresses. Still closer? Okay, uh, I can. How is this? Oh. Are you? Well, um, I won't talk any more about folly and greed just yet. Uh, the, uh, if, uh, about the worlds that will be lost if uh, global heating continues at a runaway pace. Uh, coral reefs, tropical forests, mountain glaciers, or in this case, the Arctic tundra, seen here along the Kolyma River in Siberia. Uh, I should mention that I only contributed the words. The uh, pictures, the better part of the book, are by Chris Linder, who's been working on this project for more than a decade. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about something really sexy, frozen mud which, uh, in a core sample, like this one being analyzed by a Siberian student, looks at best like stale chocolate ice cream, uh, but whose fate will have a huge impact on the future of civilization, humankind, and the planet as we know and love it. I'm talking, of course, about permafrost, which, when we st started working on this book four years ago was uh, a pretty esoteric notion. A lot of people really hadn't heard about it. It's you know, gratifying to think that that has changed uh, and uh, more and more are learning, uh, unfortunately. More and more of it is, is thawing out. Dig into Arctic soils as in this, uh, this cave that was dug to store food and research samples in Siberia and you'll find a world that is earth and ice at once. So, uh, since uh, we started on the book, as, as you know, we've seen massive wildfires in Siberia, methane bubbling out of frozen sentiments under the Laptev Sea above Siberia, and Alaskan villages collapsing as the ground beneath them thaws and softens. Uh, the Arctic does not seem to be so far away now. Its climbing is be climate is becoming more like ours, and ironically, as we know too well, pushing displaced icy air down south, making our weather occasionally more like the Arctic's. Here's why permafrost matters. You can see uh, and this, uh, that uh, it covers about a quarter of the northern hemisphere's land surface. Tropical rainforests cover only about 7%. Uh, this doesn't include vast tracts of submerged permafrost uh, uh, under the seas that have risen since the end of the ice ages, which may contain as much carbon again as the terrestrial permafrost. It, circles the globe and uh, extends as far south in the Tibetan Plateau as the latitudes of Houston and Cairo. Humans and other animals have worked out uh, brilliant strategies for surviving in this harsh environment. This is a young gray owl in the Siberian taiga uh, that's resting after, uh, after a fledgling flight. Um, uh, you can see what natural insulation he has. And uh, how well adapted in his way this uh, Venki uh, reindeer herder in, in Siberia is. All their ways of life are endangered as the 
as the world changes around them uh, through no fault of, of their own. The world they know is undergirded by uh, a vast load of organic matter that has piled up and been preserved from decay for thousands, even hundreds of thousands of years, such as these 20,000-year-old grass roots in Siberia. Siberian Yedoma, the loess that's blown up from uh, fertile steppes to the north, can lie 30 meters deep and contain 10 to 30 times as much carbon as ordinary deep mineral soils. Animal remains also last and last here. Uh, these mammoth bones exposed uh, in the uh, thawing of a riverbank along, uh, along the Kolyma River. Uh, the tusks, of course, have been uh, sold off to the ivory market where it's still legal to use ancient ivory, but uh, not to trade new ivory. Permafrost is one of our biggest carbon savings banks, and climate insurance policies. By the best estimates, it contains nearly twice as much carbon as uh, the world's atmosphere, more than all the known fossil fuel reserves, and about three times as much as all the forests in the world. But it's not always so permafrost, so permanent. Uh, the savings bank was long thought to be stable and secure, unlike forests that can be cut and burned. The Arctic operated as a net carbon sink. Not anymore. That equation has turned. It's commonly said that the Arctic is warming twice as fast as the, as the rest of the planet. But in recent years, it's been warming much faster than that. Last year, the thermometer topped 100 degrees Fahrenheit for the first time in Siberia, in the same general region where many of these photos were taken. As the soil thaws, it buckles and bends, houses tilt and become what uh, roofline sag, and they become what uh, Alaskan villagers call smiley face houses. Trees become what they call drunken trees. Permafrost isn't, me isn't uniform. It's shot through with uh, frozen water that's seeped in, uh, uh, seeped in with the contraction and uh, expansion of the soil. And uh, can the ice wedges, these ice wedges can extend up to 100 feet deep. As it thaws, the active layer, the basically thawing layer, reaches deeper and deeper. The water reaches deeper, and solid ground becomes ponds, lakes, and wetlands, releasing, as you can see, uh, well, there is always, there's always methane release at the surface uh, in summer thawing, but uh, when, when digestion goes on, but uh, as it thaws, the carbon dioxide also, the carbon di uh, equation also reverses. Sometimes it can look like the uh, Denny regrade, uh, except that uh, it's happening on a global rather than a local scale uh, and uh, is uh, being resculpted uh, thanks to greenhouse gas emissions rather than with steam shovels and sluice hoses. Fire accelerates the process. Uh, you might sound, you, it used to sound like an oxymoron. Now you've seen the news of the wildfires in the taiga forests. We'll see more, and the, but the fire doesn't just burn ta forest. Uh, even the tundra dries and burns more and more often. 
in 2014, the last year for which I've seen a complete measurement, but maybe not a record year, more acreage burned in Alaska's Yukon Kuskokwim Delta than in all the preceding 75 years. Arctic fires don't just consume vegetation. They burn away the thick blanket of duff that insulates the ground below. Dark charred soils absorb more heat, uh, accelerating the process in one of a, a number of feedback loops at work in the Arctic. Darker leafed bushes replace light leafed sedges and grasses and uh, absorb more heat and uh, reducing the reflectivity and on the process goes. When the ice melts and soils are exposed, microbes get to work digesting all that organic material. The big question is, Will they release it as carbon dioxide or as methane, like these bubbles coming up in an Alaskan lake? Uh, as you probably know, uh, well, as you know, carbon dioxide is bad enough and methane is much worse. During its nine years of molecular life, a methane molecule has about 100 times the heat trapping effect of a carbon dioxide molecule. and then it breaks down to form carbon dioxide. Bacteria operating in the presence of air generally produce carbon dioxide. In anaerobic conditions, such as underwater, they release methane. How much methane depends on a whole host of chemical, geological, hydrological, biological processes. Uh, scientists are scrambling to figure that out and to get a bigger idea of just what we face. We are, if you'll pardon a, a pun on a subject like this, looking through a, gla through a gas darkly. Now, I'd like to step back from dark thoughts for a moment and um, say a bit about how, uh, the events that led to this book. You could say it began with this uh, woman, Anya Suslova, a member of Siberia's Evenki people. Here's how the book begins. Anya had just turned 14 when the strangers arrived. They were the first foreigners and the first scientists she had ever seen. Outsiders rarely came to Zygansk, a northern outpost on Siberia's Lena River that was downgraded from town to rural locality in 1805 and never regained its status. They couldn't reach it by land in summer when the ground turned to marshy, tire-sucking muskeg, or by boat in winter when temperatures fell as low as 59 below zero Celsius, minus 75 Fahrenheit, and the Lena fro froze as hard as the unthawing soil that lay just a few feet below the taiga forest. In the warm months, Anya's father skippered a government navigation aid vessel, keeping the channels clear on the Arctic's second largest river. Anya rode along with him when she could. That summer, in 2003, a team of Russian and American scientists on a research expedition spanning the Alaskan, Canadian, and Siberian Arctic chartered the boat to take them to various sites on the Lena and its tributaries. There they gathered water samples chemical evidence of the changes going on in the vast, little-studied Russian Arctic. One of the Americans was Max Holmes, a specialist in river chemistry from a research laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Max noticed how Anya shadowed him and his colleagues, observing their curious research rituals. He began waving her over to help, and she held the bottles while he filled them. After a week, she'd learned all the procedures. If I skipped a step, she would correct me. After two weeks, the researchers had to leave. They would not be able to return to the Lena, a costly, time-consuming trek from Moscow, let alone from Massachusetts, until the next year. But Max had a heap of unused sample bottles and a bright idea. Listen, he said to Anya via a translator, it's really expensive for us to come here, and it would be really helpful if you could continue gathering samples while we're gone. 
It was really no big deal. Max didn't expect anything to come of it. But when he and his colleagues returned to Zygansk the next summer, they were amazed to discover, that, to discover that Anya had continued taking samples along the Lena every two weeks and storing them in a freezer usually dedicated to holding fish and moose meat. Her diligence uh, bore results far beyond the data set that she contributed to. Gave, they gave Max uh, the idea of uh, that, you know, maybe, um, Maybe young people could do more than they're usually credited with, even on the scientific front. Max never pushed me to become a scientist, she recounts, but he gave me two gifts. One was a digital camera. He thought that I might become a great photographer, but I just took selfies and pictures of my girlfriends. <laughs> the second gift was more important, a subscription to National Geographic in English. It opened my world and got me to learn English so I could learn, the, so I could read the articles. The subscription included a map of the world. I put it on my wall and dreamed of going places. Uh, sure enough, she did to Yakutsk and then to Korea and then to India's uh, leading uh, Indian Science uh, Institute to study, got a master's degree in climate science and now works as a research assistant at the Woods Hole Research Center, where I met her. And she got Max to thinking that uh, about, what, uh, about what young people just might be able to do. That led to something called, uh, pardon me, I may get this down one of these times, but <laughs> that wasn't that time. Uh, let's see. Joey, do you? Well, coming attractions on the left. There we go. Yeah, the, uh, that led to something called the Polaris Project. Each summer, uh, the Woods Hole Center gathers a group of intrepid undergraduates from around the world, uh, from China, Puerto Rico, to Bakersfield and Baltimore, um, uh, the year I met them, and helps them design and conduct their own original research into the changes occurring in the Alaskan tundra. They started out working in uh, working in Siberia at the Russian uh, Academy of Sciences Northeast Science Station, hosted by the in inimitable Sergei Zaimov, you might have heard of him, uh, who's uh, started a kind of an audacious experiment in rewilding called Pleistocene Park to restore the grasslands of the Mammoth Steppe and the megafauna that used to inhabit them. Uh, uh, you know, in the uh, belief that the grasslands will both uh, absorb less heat and store much more carbon than, uh, than tundra, lichens, and bushes uh, do now. Uh, you might have also heard about uh, a Harvard geneticist who uh, once has an even wilder idea of uh, uh, adding recreated woolly mammoths to the, uh, to the mix there. The Polaris Project's premise um, uh, is that because they're not so immersed in conventional thinking and don't have to get good results so they can get jobs and funding, uh, undergrads can take more chances and come up with questions and experiments that no one else might think of. Uh, on the ground, it still means a lot of finicky digging into... Uh, into very, uh, very messy stuff. Uh, uh, all the while, fending off the famous Arctic mosquitoes and flies. But that premise seems to pan out. Uh, one example, one Polaris student, uh, researcher, Nigel Golden, wanted to study animals, but that wasn't really on the menu there. He insisted and set out to uh, figure out whether the Many tunnels dug by Arctic ground squirrels in the tundra uh, affect carbon emissions and, uh, uh, and uh, thawing. He actually found a substantial contribution. Uh, his work was widely reported and presented at conferences around the world, and it's added a new factor 
zoogenic carbon emissions to climate research. Uh, in fact, that's, that's uh, Nigel on the right there. Uh, uh, another student researcher, Megan Benke, in the yellow jacket, told me what the work meant, means to her. What's happening to the tundra is objectively terrifying, the way all climate change is objectively terrifying. It makes you feel powerless. But in research, I'm also trying to deal with an interesting problem. Curiosity makes it easier to not feel paralyzed and become a weeping heap on the floor. Getting to study the changes doesn't make them less frightening, but it helps me live with the fear. It's the students them themselves who give Sue Natali, Polaris's current director, a glimmer of hope. They're not beaten down, she told me. They feel positive. For them, there are no limits. They bring that spirit to science and to changing the world and making things better. I look at them and I think, You've convinced, you're convinced it can happen, I'm convinced it can happen. Most of us, however, don't have the luxury of transmuting our anxiety and, into alarm, and alarm into the curiosity that drives science. The prospect of upheaval in the basic systems that make our planet verdant, fruitful, extravagantly rich in life and variety, and very simply, habitable, is daunting at the least. Scientists warn not just of the dire effects to come if we don't wean ourselves off fossil fuels, but of the effects of greenhouse gases already pumped into the atmosphere, there to reside for hundreds, in some cases thousands of years. Uh, as the Oregon State uh, Oceanographer Burke Hales puts it, we've mailed ourselves a package and now we can't call it back. But we can restrain ourselves from sending more packages and uh, preparing for that package's arrival. Last year's election and the new administration have bought a, brought a bracing, uh, if belated, resurgence of so far mostly efforts in that direction. But the political pendulum has swung before and it will likely swing again. The wretched failure of governments at every level from micro local to macro international to cooperate, cooperate in, can, in containing the current pandemic doesn't bode well for the much more fraught and complex task of containing global heating. But before we melt into a puddle of despair, uh, I'd like to read a bit from the book's conclusion. Faced with these dire prospects, it's easy to take refuge in despair, to think if the glaciers are melting and the coral reefs are dying, I just want to see them before they go. But as the journalist and indefatigable optimist Norman Cousins liked to say, nobody knows enough to be pessimistic. Cynicism, like so many drugs, provides temporary escape, but turns toxic and crippling. Human nature is more adaptable than the doomsayers and denialists suppose. That's the secret of Homo sapiens runaway success, which has brought us to our current climate plight. Change is really slow until it's fast. Societies, as well as natural systems, reach tipping points. They can change direction and shed attitudes and policies that seem implacably embedded in culture in a historical blink of the eye. Consider how quickly the isolationist United States and its similarly unprepared allies mobilized to defeat the Axis powers after getting caught flat-footed in 1939-41. Or how racial, racial and gender equality came to be legally enshrined and widely, if incompletely, accepted in a matter of decades after centuries of discrimination and worse. The pendulum swung for marriage equality in just a few short years. Mass mobilization and system, systemic change ultimately depend on concerted, that is, political action, but they well up first from the bottom, from millions of personal conversions of examples set and persuasions achieved, ultimately coalescing in popular demand that politicians cannot ignore.
The critical federal rights, civil rights legis legislation of 1964 and 65 did not come from on high. It grew out of decades of advocacy and agitation from lonely personal protests to mass marches and boycotts. As President Franklin Roosevelt is famously said to have told one of those advocates, okay, you've convinced me. Now go out there and bring pressure on me. Making carbon sensible choices in our daily lives is the first step in stepping up. Beyond the intrinsic value of the action is the little nudge this adds toward moving society as a whole. Stepping up puts a face on change, proving that it is possible and that the world as we know it won't come to an end if we embrace it and decide we don't really need that, uh, that stake or um, that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that gas hog car. Reducing one's individual's greenhouse impact makes an infinitesimal, infinitesimal difference on the global scale. A million or billion reductions start to add up. The example they set and the market changes they drive may matter even more. At the political level, those who understand climate change as an existential challenge to human and other life need to act and especially to vote on that understanding. Gun rights and anti-abortion advocates have something to teach us on that score. Their political influence derives not from their numbers but from their fervor and focus. They demand not just lip service, but action. Candidates know they will lose voice, votes if they cross them. By contrast, contra concern for the climate and support for, for environmental protection tend to be like Delta floodwaters, broad but shallow. Both have gross, grow, grown in recent years, driven by dire storms, flood, and wildfires, and by the threat perceived from the last administration. But Americans polled in 2019 still placed environmental protection below terrorism, economic concerns, healthcare costs, and education on their list of priorities, and climate action lower still. And that was before police violence and the pandemic swamped uh, many other concerns. Advocates for action must show the great mass of lip service supporters that a rapidly heating climate will overturn every other aspect of life. That, as the great civil rights leader, James Farmer said, if we do not save the environment, then whatever we, whatever we do in civil, civil rights will be of no meaning because then we will have the equality of extinction. Excuse me. I Okay. Well, I'd like I'd, li I'd like to end on a uh, on a hopeful image. A Siberian crane, since uh, cranes in many cultures are symbols of wisdom, renewal, uh, hope, and even Im immortality. Although they also traditionally represent greed in European tradition. Uh, and uh, to add one more thought that's um, occupied me lately, climate denialism is in retreat. Uh, change in its effects are just too evident now. I'm more worried about climate nihilism. Uh, the view that yes, global heating is yet real, and yes, it will be devastating, and yes, it's inevitable, and if we don't change our ways. But people won't change their ways, so why should I change mine? My individual contribution to the problem is a tiny part of it. So leave it to governments to solve it or not solve it. There's nothing to be done, so eat, steak and, eat steak and be merry, crank up the heat and air conditioning, drive that Yukon, and fly around the world on a whim. For tomorrow, the world as we know it dies. Uh, someone I know very well uh, essentially takes that view. He has more than a dozen children and grandchildren but he refuses to trouble himself about the legacy we're leaving them. Or perhaps he doesn't dare to think about it. I don't know if this attitude is uh, serenity or, or cowardice, 
but uh, multiplied many times over in many forms, it's, uh, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. With a denialist, you can argue facts, uh, but how do you argue with that? Good luck in any conversations you may have, and thank you for listening, for reading, for caring, and for acting. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, you know, as you can see, this is very important work that he's talking about. And I'm sure people out there have questions. And Eric, if you wouldn't mind, uh, we'll go ahead and field a few of those. Oh, actually, I'd much rather hear your questions than to listen to more of, more of me. Yes, right here. Uh, they, they do expose it to air, which means to warming, which means to, oh, about the ground squirrels, whether, whether they cause more carbon release or less. Uh, they do, uh, they do expose, they do expose it to air, uh, and, um, and so they, they can, uh, that can, um, that can uh, enable more warming and release. On the other hand, because it's exposed to air, uh, it will be released as carbon dioxide uh, rather, rather than methane. When I said substantial, I meant substantially measurable. I don't think it's not a, it's far from a huge factor, but it is just one more factor when they're trying to get a precise uh, carbon exchange balance. Steve. So I'm sorry, that what are worse or better? Better or worse than we might have thought. So can you bring us up to date on some of the recent research that's happened about uh, the release of carbon from these, uh, these territories? Well, there, you know, there is, there has been a back and forth. I think a lot of it is also about um, uh, releases from uh, underwater uh, fr methane uh, clathates, uh, frozen methane, basically. In the uh, at the deep levels, uh, which some people thought would be a big time bomb, then was uh, did not look uh, did not look so unstable. But we actually are getting we actually are getting releases. Uh, yeah, everything I've seen uh, says that the um, that the releases are um, you know are continuing and uh, and even accelerating. Uh, there, uh, you know, it's happening ahead of what was uh, of what was projected ten and more ten and more years ago, when they expected more stability. Um, Steve, you're uh, this by, by the by, yeah. By the way, this is Steve Olson, a um, uh, science writer par excellence here in Seattle. Uh, uh, and I was just going to say, have you seen uh, have you seen any recent research that suggests otherwise? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, yeah, and these are enormously complex systems, and you've got like that little case of the ground squirrels. You've got you've got you've got all sorts of uh, uh, all, all sorts of um, um, uh, uh, responses in both in both directions. So, but that's why they keep uh, working on it. Uh, B. Oh, uh, yeah, no, they, um, in fact, the Polaris group met with, uh, um, with villagers nearby in the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta, you know, talking about what they were seeing, and, you know, and said, I, I used to have to, uh, I used to have to re, um, to shore up my house, basically re, 
re-anchor my house uh, every five years. Now I have to do it every year, and I'm not sure how long I can keep uh, doing it. Uh, there, um, there uh, the Alaskan salmon runs, of course, uh, and there may be con uh, you know, a number of influences here, but many of them are declining. Uh, runs that were really, really strong, even in, even in the Yukon River uh, to the north, which is sort of the, um, the, uh, the ultimate refuge for, uh, for salmon. Uh, and, uh, in Beaver, Alaska, in northeast um, Alaska, I, I talked with a, um, um, with a, uh, uh, a native of, of the village who has, has also gone into climate science. Um, she, said the, she said that the rivers, which are their essential transportation arteries, are silting up so they can't get around uh, anymore uh, by boat, have a very hard time. Uh, the silt also covers salmon reds and is reducing the spawning uh, there. Uh, the, the thawing, of course, uh, softening the ground makes it harder to get around, uh, harder, sometimes impossible to get around in winter. Um, you know, believe it or not, I've heard people up in um, up in uh, Ukliavik, uh, Barrow uh, say that the you know that the dark winter months are really the uh, are really the nice ones because then you can travel on the ice and go hunting, and the re in the summer you're you're stuck in town. Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Did anybody else? Get Well, there are uh, 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 many, many, many woodland species are moving further north. You've got moose uh, uh, who've um, made it up to the uh, actually to the Beaufort Sea, to the to the shores of the uh, Arctic Ocean, uh, caribou territory, which was unheard of. Uh, but uh, but uh, whether they're thriving is another question. I mean, for the, uh, for the ungulates, the inc oh, uh, many species of flies and mosquitoes are really thriving. And, uh, and that's bad news for the ungulates, uh, for the caribou, uh, because uh, they, uh, I mean, they're just constantly tormented by them. Uh, they lose energy and lose opportunities to eat as they're trying to evade and brush them off, and they weaken, and that can, actually be fatal. But uh, that's one example. Other, other ranges are, uh, as I think you, as, as uh, bird nerds, uh, you know, other ranges are moving further and further north. And as hummingbirds are having a great time, uh, they've shown up in Alaska. Uh, yeah, you had a question, Nick. Right, right. I would that would that would make sense as you get more as you get more thawing. Uh, also, as you get more as you get more um, uh, bushes growing up. In, in Can you review for me the um, what generates methane versus carbon emissions and what the trade-offs are for uh, climate change? Uh, versus carbon dioxide emissions. Sure, uh, methane CH four. Uh, is uh, formed by uh, bacteria in anaerobic, by anaerobic bacteria uh, without the presence of oxygen. And uh, it's, um, so in, in the guts of ruminants, for example, uh, and in Arctic lake beds, in rice paddies, which are a major source, uh, in landfills, uh, one more reason to uh, keep, your, keep your compost out of the, uh, out of the trash. And uh, um, what are the trade-offs the trade are methane is a shorter-lived molecule. About uh, nine, nine years is uh, average molecular life. Uh, but it has a much, much, and I'm no atmospheric science, scientist, but it has uh, about 100 times up to the, uh, the screening value, the, that is the greenhouse value, as far as c capturing, reflecting heat back to the Earth's surface that carbon dioxide does. Do you have any perspective on the, uh, the comparative order of magnitude between methane and carbon dioxide 
Uh, per, uh, permafrost thawing is still a tiny, would be a tiny factor on the global scale, but that's of course because permafrost was supposed to be a stable, um, uh, um, a stable uh, containment. Uh, in in the uh, the largest source of uh, of methane, it's actually a natural one, um, kind of a baseline is wetlands. Uh, but wetlands are important for many, many other reasons. Uh, the largest uh, anthropogenic source is, um, is uh, cattle, uh, sheep, and, and uh, is, is agriculture, mainly, mainly uh, uh, ruminants. Uh, the next largest is, um, is fossil fuel use. Uh, methane, methane gas is released in coal mining. It leaks out of... Uh, uh, in the uh, transmission and storage of, uh, of natural gas. Um, fixing that is pretty straightforward plumbing, but you have to make the uh, companies do it. Um, the Biden administration is reinstating uh, rules there. And uh, the next largest anthropogenic source is uh, rice paddies, um, which, um, you know, rice is nice, but there are all sorts of other greens that are uh, tasty too. I'm, I'm, I found that stir fry, go, stir fry goes great on barley. Uh, Joey. Could you, could you speak for a minute about the uh, release of ancient viruses and disease? Uh, what is the meaning of that? In the thawing of that? Uh, uh, Joey asked if uh, I could uh, speak some about the release of uh, ancient viruses uh, as uh, as organic matter as 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 they thaw, uh, and no, I can't say much about that. I'm afraid, but if you can, uh, please, I'd I'd like to hear about it. Mm-hmm. Oh yes, and, and yeah, yeah. Okay, not just viruses, but uh, uh, yeah, no, no. Uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, ba uh, uh, bacterial uh, 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 spores. Uh, anthrax is one that can uh, that can stay buried in the uh, buried in the ground, uh, uh, can stay dormant for many decades and and be released. Uh, I think, uh, and because that's something that's been controlled, but they have had they have had outbreaks in Siberia, animal outbreaks and. You know, maybe human outbreaks. The, the, we don't always get all the news out of Russia, uh, and uh, I think bubonic plague is kind of endemic in, um, you know, in, in a lot of rodents there, and in the southwestern United States. Uh, the Canadian and Alaskan? Well, there's a lot more in Siberia because Siberia is a lot bigger. Uh, the, um, there seems to have been, but I haven't seen any good data, more dramatic warming in, uh, uh, in, in Siberia in the past few years. Uh, the temperatures have uh, run really high. Uh, there is probably, um, probably deeper uh, deeper organic permafrost in Siberia, just because you've had so much soil blown up from the from the vast steppes uh, of Central and Eastern Asia, and and it can and it can go uh, be it can be a hundred feet deep the Yeroma there. I haven't seen measurements on, and I don't know if anybody has really done measurements on um, on Canadian and Arctic permafrost to see how deep the uh, that organic material goes. You know, you have some, it's basically the same process. Uh, uh, you, 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 I mean, you have, you have, you have some difference in, in species, but uh, uh, the compositional difference, I suspect, and I, 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 but I don't know, is that there might be, is that there uh, might be deeper, um, uh, uh, deeper uh, organic uh, soils in, in Siberia. Uh, 
you know, it very, uh, what you have also varies, of course, in terrain. I mean, in uh, upland uh, uh, mountain areas, um, Alaska is a mix of flat and, uh, flat and mountainous. Although, of course, in the mountains, you tend to, ha you tend to still have um, permanent snowpack. Uh, you have bigger rivers in Siberia uh, and much wider deltas, which could make for, um, for more and deeper water and ice wedges. But again, I'm just guessing on that. Yeah, uh, one more who hasn't asked yet and then. Uh, gee, uh, the last chapter of the book is kind of, kind of tries to speak to that, but uh, there are so many things and more things than I know. I mean, I think it calls on the um, imagination, the creativity, and if you will, the uh, opportunism of all of us to, to look for opportunities uh, to do that. Uh, to teach your children a sense of responsibility, but also of hope, because uh, you know, um, hopelessness will, can, will cripple action just as much as, uh, um, as, as blind optimism will. Uh, I, I believe, and I, you know, I, some people don't, I believe, I believe in trying to practice um, in, in, in individual practice. Again, just for the example, don't be the, uh, the uh, clothesline Nazi, but setting that example. Um, uh, you know, radiates out. Uh, it's also, I think, very good discipline for our own thinking. It's hard to be serious uh, about the uh, big causes if you're doing stupid, wasteful little things yourself. Um, Steve, to oh, I'm sorry. I just have a question. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's, there, there's hope in that, or do you think it's, it, it's kind of a fool's game? You know, it sounds wild, uh, but, you know, and, and Sergei Zimov is certainly a wild kind of character. If you've, re if you've read about him, he's given to some very grand pronouncements and maybe some tongue-in-cheek ones as well. Uh, you know, he thinks that, he says that smoking is, smoking is good because we grew up, uh, uh, our species evolved breathing campfire smoke, so we're, we're adapted to it. Uh, uh, but uh, he's, been, he's been right on, you know, on other things as well, such as the, um, uh, such as uh, the, the depth of those uh, Yeruma, Yeruma soils in Siberia. You know, there, grasslands really are great, um, uh, great carbon storing uh, uh, systems. Um, they, uh, as well as being hugely productive uh, food systems, uh, and uh, to maintain them, well, you can look at what uh, what happens in the in the Serengeti. Uh, in, and other savanna areas in East Africa. Uh, uh, the, um, when they got rid of elephants, uh, trees and brushes grew up and covered the savanna. And a uh, great, ma great many other wild animals declined because they didn't have the, the uh, richer food of the grasses. Uh, when elephants came back, they knocked down, chewed up, and trampled those, uh, ate those trees and bushes, and the savanna came back. I mean, they're, they're kind of uh, custodians of the savanna, and um, and the same thing seems to uh, seems to happen in the northern steppes as well. So the argument is that the um, that the whatever you have, whether it's mammoths or uh, rewilded horses or bison, musk oxen, uh, uh, wild wild sheep, they've got all of them. Uh, they'll um, uh, they will uh, trample down the, the bushes as well as chewing them up and the grasses will replace them, which also uh, increases the albedo, the reflect, reflectivity of the, um, of the surface. Uh, they distribute nutrients uh, through their dung and uh, 
the experiment is to see if that will bring back the, the grassy step. I think it's interesting. Don't, don't go anywhere yet. Uh, I think we still have a couple of questions. Uh, oh, okay. If we, do we have time? Oh, okay. Yeah, please. Yeah, seaweed. Seaweed, that that reduces the methane. I, you know, I think that's also really interesting and really, uh, 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 really encouraging. I don't know that if it's, and there, ha and there have been some trials that seem to suggest that it works. It doesn't eliminate the methane, but it, it does, but it does reduce it. Uh, but there's still a lot of methane released. Uh, you know, the environmental impacts of cattle, of, of 1.5 billion cattle on this planet don't, uh, uh, don't of course end with the methane releases, the amount of water consumption and uh, that. I should say also though in restoring the uh, uh, it, you know, in restoring the step one factor, you're gonna, you'd have to consider you have to consider is uh, how much methane uh, those animals, especially the uh, un the uh, um, the uh, yaks and musk oxen and other ruminants uh, uh, will release. That would be one part of the balance. B, I think you had another. You know, it's a lot of work, but uh, policy making is always like that. Uh, uh, it, whether, you know, you're talking about education, transportation, policing. Uh, where, is the, where is the balance between, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, get, in getting security and equity, uh, police who will protect, uh, protect people and um, who can protect people sometimes with violence and not endanger people. Uh, you know, that's, it's, that, it's the work that you have to do, and um, as they say, these are empirical questions. Uh, you can cite, power, you can cite uh, uh, the windmills away from bird migration corridors. Uh, you, could, you might also think about doing the, same, doing the same or finding other ways to mitigate, uh, uh, mitigate uh, uh, skyscrapers, uh, and, uh, of course. Uh, and you, uh, I think that, you know, there should be more of an ethic of uh, use it up before you need to replace it. I mean, um, I'll make a confession. I, I, uh, I, I lose a lot of respect when people see my car, which is a, 90, a, a 1991 Geo Metro with a three-cylinder engine that gets uh, 51 miles on the highway and, you know, high 30s uh, uh, average. Um, uh, but you know, it's, I'm going to drive it as long as it'll drive. Uh, uh, it's, it's, ki it's kind of embedded energy has been fully amortized. And um, it always finds a parking space, too. I'll drive it. Uh, I'll, I'll drive it as little, uh, you know, as little as I can. But uh, when I need to drive, I'll, uh, I'll use that. Uh, it's the same way in building reuse when there was all the enthusiasm over lead standards and, um, and uh, Companies and and agencies were competing to boast about their uh, their wonderful uh, super uh, you know super energy efficient uh, water efficient buildings. Well, they were often tearing down um, uh, perfectly good buildings that could be uh, that could be repurposed. And though they would never be as efficient, would take much less of cement, which has a terrible carbon footprint of its own. Uh, so. Yeah. So what's one thing as we as individuals can do? You know, on a day to day basis. One of the like easy, you know, it's one of the easy things that you can do. 
Well, I would say more than one thing. But are you asking about oh, what's some low hanging what's some low hanging fruit? You know, I mean, pending the uh, co confirming and the widespread use of, uh, I mean, unless seaweed really proves to be a miracle and is universally adopted, and you know, so far most beef growers I don't think are interested in that. I mean, really low hanging fruit is. Um, is eating no meat or as little as you can and, uh, and make it something other than uh, beef, lamb, or depending where you live in the world, goat. Uh, uh, that's, that's, that's a lot. I mean, there are others that are not huge in impact but are also really easy. I mean, clotheslines are great. I've, I've dried clothes in 11 out of 12 months of the year in Seattle. You, you, you look for your sunny day. I learned it from my mother who always had a clothesline. And, you know, it's a really, it's, it's just, I mean, it's not a huge impact, but dryers 90% of the time, I think, uh, are, are just superfluous and more trouble. Uh, you know, time spent out in the sunshine hanging clothes is not deducted from lifespan. Yeah, especially if you have birds coming around. I had, a, I had an Anna's hummingbird uh, for, uh, do the, uh, that great mating, uh, buzz bomb mating display just as I was at the clothesline. Uh, that's just, the, that, 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 that's an example of something really easy. I mean, obviously, obviously walking, uh, bicycling are good for us um, and uh, taking the bus is good. Uh, as far as your house, I mean, you know, Fix it, seal the cracks and um, and uh, and fill in the insulation before you um, uh, before you uh, go spend uh, spend a lot on solar panels. So those are great too. And then go and then go get the solar panels and the, or the high efficiency or the heat pump. Yeah, I'm sorry, Ann, did you? You know, I, I guess I'd have to say I love doing it. Uh, I mean, it's it's fun, it's challenging, it's interesting. Um, it's in a way I, I, I feel I'm I feel like such a I don't know what a um, uh, I, I kind of like a hanger on around scientists who are doing the you know who are doing the real research because I I don't I I realized I wouldn't have the uh, the discipline probably to be just conducting that meticulous, endless, pre precise, and often very boring work. Uh, but it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's challenging. It's great to always be learning new things. Uh, it's, um, I suppose I get some of the same consolation that that Polaris uh, student, Megan Benke, was talking about, um, to feel like I'm participating. Uh, and um, and not just passively waiting for things to uh, fall apart. So, 
Uh, and, but that can come in many ways. Uh, you know, it occurs to me, and, and you mentioned the importance in schools. Uh, I mean, there would be so much opportunity for volunteers, schools that can't afford whole new curriculums, to, um, and to just have uh, community people who can talk about it. I'm sure many, many people here would be among them. Uh, who, can, who can talk about, uh, about the local environment and global questions and kind of bring it home. Yes. I think it's harder to find, I mean, obviously in California, you can, you can stop sprawling and building into the, uh, the wildland interface and, um, and uh, exposing people to more fires and potential fires to more people. Uh, but uh, it's, Again, uh, on the political level, uh, you can uh, you can support and you know you can look. The Mountaineers uh, has um, is one of many groups campaigning long and hard uh, against the uh, against the development of the uh, Arctic Wildlife Refuge and uh, and other wildlands there against the uh, 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 the uh, Pebble Gold Mine at the headwaters of Bristol Bay. Uh, and uh, you know there are uh, there's a lot there's a lot to do just in just to keep um, just to keep uh, uh, energy and mining uh, companies' hands off of those uh, rich but uh, but really precarious resources. Uh, there's I, you know there are such there are so many feedback loops in the Arctic. Um, and they happening at such big scale, uh, it's, I, I, as far as I can see, it's harder to specifically address them. But everything you do down here, you, you do down here is to the benefit up there because everything up down here from mercury emissions from coal burning to plastic waste uh, goes from the densely inhabited mid-zone of the, of, the, uh, of the planet to the sparsely inhabited Arctic. But yes, support the young people. And if that, didn't, if that's, if that, wasn't, if that wasn't implicit in what I was uh, saying before, that's, that's really another take home I got from, from seeing the uh, Polaris, uh, Polaris people. They're, um, they're clear-eyed and, uh, and they're not so jaded. And uh, you know, whether Extinction Rebellion, uh, uh, rebellion uh, uh, the Sunrise Movement, and many others. Uh, uh, yeah, we, it's time for us to follow them. So, so as we began uh, the, the evening, and don't go too far yet, Eric, uh, Eric was also telling me that uh, he's got a great topic for his next book, uh, something that should touch the hearts of everybody who is a member of Audubon. Yeah, I don't want to go into it too much because I'm, um, it's uh, still in the proposal drafting stage. Anyway, it will be a book about birds, in particular about avian evolution and, uh, and what it can teach us. So. Well, everyone, let's give a big hand for Eric and uh, 
Eric, thank you so much for coming out with us tonight. So there is a book, <laughs> and we do have it for sale here. Uh, it's back at the, the table there. I'm not sure if Eric is open to personalizing books or not. And, and maybe you can get a little extra information that you might want to figure out. I do want to share one little piece of the book that I particularly cared about. Uh, a very short passage. This is by uh, Megan Benke. Uh, she was one of the people doing the research for uh, Polaris. Falling in love in a place that is in danger makes you fight harder for it. And I think that's one of the great things about this book. As, um, as Eric was scrolling through a lot of those images, you saw that there were so many great images uh, captured by uh, Chris Linder. And the books that are coming through Braver River are almost coffee table books with such rich images that are printed very, very well. And so this book is about science, it's about wisdom, it's about heart, it's about place, and it's about opportunity for you to do something about it. So I encourage you all to get a copy of this book, and then once you finish reading it, pass it on to someone. Because one of the things that really comes out of the book is that not everybody knows about permafrost. And if you don't know about permafrost, you don't know about the condition that it's in right now. So this is an opportunity for you to kind of pass that information on. And as you can see, that big image on the screen there wonderfully captured is methane bubbling up underneath the water. And so that's the critical condition that that, that circumstance has reached. And uh, as, we, as we leave for the evening, I want to give you a little um, something, something a local uh, artist put together. She, was, she wanted to talk about a really artistic way to uh, to show about uh, carbon. And with that, I'll say good night.